All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Amy, for this introduction. And of course, while I try and share my screen, let me also uh, thank uh, Adele Bardazzi for putting together this amazing uh, conference program. I'm so thrilled to actually be opening this first panel and also a bit preoccupied as my presentation comes after the wonderful keynote by just Jessica Hemmings, which I very, very much enjoyed. But I will delve right in because I don't want to use more than the 15 minutes. So I have my stopwatch right here to, to time my presentation. And I hope I, I have been able to share the screen so you should be seeing the, my very first opening slide. So my presentation today, as per, per the title, deals with the imagery of textual textile embroidery that characterizes the intermediate ventures with visual and printing techniques of Italian poets Cattila Rocca and Giulia Nicolai, who in 1970s Italy, hence in coincidence with the birth of the Italian women movement, appear engaged in a quest for self-determination as female artists on the basis of multiple entanglements of poetry and textiles conceived as meaning making tools for alternative embodiments of the eye. The textual textile metaphor in particular is for them a sort of material way to re-envision the relationship between the self and the world beyond the traditional binary logic that characterizes the Western civilization, the one that opposes subject and object, mind and body, form and content, and of course, man and woman all the while refusing or transfiguring verbal language, which as Italian philosopher Adriana Cavarero has beautifully and poignantly explained in her pivotal work towards a theory of a sexual difference, was never made to speak for women, hiding a masculine subject behind the falsely universal eye of the discourse and thus relegating women to a negative authority, that of being something other than a man. For La Rocca and Nicolai, this text textile metaphor is rooted primarily in the sphere of manual skills, as is frequently shown by their creative statements, or we could also call them non-statements, as I will shortly show, which are often orchestrated on the imagery of the thread and of a refined textual embroidery as a way of twisting the stereotype female chores traditionally executed by women with hands, especially calligraphy and sewing, in order to transform them into poetry. In 1974, for instance, Cathy Larocca, who had just discovered the brain tumor that would cause her premature death just two years later in 1976, entrusted to these fragmentary verses the deepest sense of her work as an artist, pulling together female condition, language, and abilities against the patriarchal institutions of her time. And I'm only going to read the highlighted uh, portion of the text. It is not time for women to make statements. They have too much to do, and then they should use a language that is not their own. As far as I'm concerned, I have all the defects of women without having their qualities. A negative feminine, like others, expropriated of everything but those things that do not appeal to anyone. Hands, for instance, too late for female abilities, too poor and unable to keep hoarding. It is preferable to embroider with words and accelerate the universal paranoia. Interestingly, in that very year, 1974, Julia Nicolai was publishing for Gaiji Edition, Poem I Object, an artist's book, so poem and object, basically, is the translation of the title, an artist's book of 41 concrete and visual poems, where the clash of words, drawing, photographs, and tiny day-to-day -day objects is largely based on the subversion of the marginalized female activities of knitting and sewing. And this is how Nicolai described the book 40 years later on the occasion of its 2014 reprinting for the edition in Berry. Several visual poems are about knitting or sewing. The intertwining of wool knitted with needles is visually imitated in whole whole or in knit knot. We have the printed buttons, uh, ex uh, the image of pins, etc. At the age of 10, I had already decided that I would have never done the kind of feminine work, and the fact that I could call them poems, giving them that title, also wanted to be my sincere thanks in 1974 for the new space of freedom that feminism was bringing to us. I, uh, lie, I enjoyed doing it like that with a low voice. Why a low voice? It is more elegant. Almost fear, La Rocca Nicolai never met, nor were otherwise connecting during their lives. Neither Neither were they directly involved with the feminist movement. However, the affinities of their words are striking. 
They both seem to foster an indirect definition of femininity grounded on voluntary marginality, low voice or silence, aimed at overcoming the prejudice of the surrounding world, still anchored to the belief that girls should use their hands to cross stitch swallows and flowers, and that all women's discourse and thoughts shall be determined by their emotional life. Hands, instead, can open the door to, the, to that vertiginous mise en abîme, which is the female identity. They can reappropriate writing through an affirmation of independence that capitalizes on their expropriation of everything, on those things that nobody wants, but that women have learned to use to break the hopeful male versus female dialectic. In their self-identification as women artists by means of inclusive networks of material fragments knitted together, interwoven with ellipses, gaps, and repetition, and excluded completely from the symbolic order of male culture, Lalaka Nikolai come thus to comply with some of the feminist tropes that American art critic Liz Lippert had described in uh, just two years before in her 1973 essay, Why Separate Women's Art? which was later included in From the Center. A uniform density or overall texture, often senselessly tactile and repetitive, the preponderance of circular forms, layers or strata, a certain kind of fragmentation. And yet, while Lucy Lippert was one of the first critics ever to speak about La Roca, suggesting her powerful combination of extreme concreteness with forms of minimal and conceptual art, shortly after her death, it was also Lucy Lippert that lamented that Larocca had been unable to break into the male art world with her art or writings, hence basically confirming the social cultural dominance of the male establishment and ultimately haunting Larocca's recognition up until the 2000s. If we exclude those studies that have concentrated to our limited participation to the mostly male technological poetry of the Florentine Gruppo 70. The same has actually happened also to Nicolai, whose work has often been wrongly associated to the Gruppo 63, which represented the only official and definitely homosocial literary neo avant in Italy, and to which Nicolai contributed only as working editor for the magazine Quindici. What is missing, though, though uh, thus, is an evaluation of La Rocca and Nicolai's desire for subjectivity within a different framework, based on female categories aimed to break out and not into the fallow logocentric universe. Grounded, as Anne Marisa Zoboetti would write in a 1976 article that appeared on Studio International, on the infinite potential of their negative capability. A negative capability meant as the disruptive otherness of femininity and openly identified by both La Rocca and Nicolai with textual and textile work. So let now, let's now thus examine some of these examples of otherness alongside its connection with the textual and textile imagery, which for La Rocca often takes the disquieting forms of body art. This that you're seeing on the slide is one of the craniology uh, pieces uh, from the craniology series developed between 1973 and 1976, in which Laraka superimposes her hands to X-ray images of her cancer-sick brain, in poignant gestures of anisiness, almost as the original power rooted in female hands could not fit within the limited space of the objectualized male world. Embroidered on the outline of the X-rays, we can see a discontinuously handwritten chain of the pronoun you, whose distance is emphasized by the use of language other than Italian, of course, which triggers a relational effort meant to remain unresolved. A form of embroidering with words, calligraphy, the only material expression of absolute individualism, enables La Rocca to reappropriate pieces of her own reality, opposing the reified the existence of her own disease and its brutal medical display. It is only a matter of time for the hand to be fully colonized by what Lea Vergine, in her pivotal work Il Corpo Come Linguaggio, has called the UU Mantra, as in this 1975 work entitled Indeed UU, which unleashes the poetic obsession that merges female hands and handwriting in an embroidered stigmata of a liminal yet material existence. Another example that I would like to briefly linger on comes from La Rocca's Riduzioni, reductions we might translate, politics in which she deconstructs the aura of various kinds of historical advertising or personal images by using sheets of tracing paper to reduce them into sort of outlines, first obtained through an embroidered chain of non-intelligible handwritten text and then dissolved into just linear threads. This is a three-part Riduzione, I'm just showing the first uh, part, 
which originates from a photo of the artist staging the set for a black and white video, Appendice per una supplica, Appendix for a Petition, which is the first film in art history to show manual gesture, a stage as a sort of confrontation between female and male hands, and which was presented at the Venice Biennale in 1972. In the foreground of this initial photo of this three-part reduzione, we see a video camera on a tripod uh, pointing at the artist who has her back turned toward us and appears to be kneeling over a black box that contains a screen. Behind the box, there is also a large canvas um, which uh, is basically covered in thick black uh, charcoal, created so to obtain a sort of indistinct background and interestingly resembling a textile framework. This complex uh, framing game is then completed by the vertical profile of a male figure, which we see from the forearm arm down and from behind, occupying the right side of the picture and symbolically limiting the physical and cultural space of the woman. This, however, changes in the second part of the um, Riduzione, where La Rocca chooses a particular diaphragm to trace the, the outlines of the initial photo. And if you see, you can, if you look closely, you can see the text that is basically um, tracing the, the outlines. And this text is entitled Dal Momento in Cui, From the Moment When. And it's a synthetically perfect text without meaning that La Rocca herself elaborated in 1970 as a form of mockery of intellectual jargon, and which she often reused under different forms, for example, printed on canvas or performed. And here you have the text typewritten and then handwritten. Creating such a textual textile border for herself, Laraka seems to see the impossibility of any intersubjective verbal communication, all the while asserting her authorship because the text is of her own. Now, by chance, also in 1973, Laraka staged a performance named Berbigerazione, named after a psychiatric disorder based on the obsessive repetition of random words, at the 10th Quadrinale d'Arte in Rome, which consisted in the recital of the very text, Dal Momento in Cui, by painter Giordano Falzoni, while she guided him. By trapping or framing the man's voice into an impossible discourse, Laraka has called into question gender positioning, overturning women's secondary function in art, inspirational, celebratory, whatsoever, and exposing the failures of patriarchal language. The last part of the new lavoro, where Laraka reduces the image to an almost invisible line of drawing, ultimately sanctions her search for material empathy and intellectual solipsism, allowing her to step out of the masculine field of creativity without renouncing to emerge as a subject. By making a tabula rasa of the world in which she operates while also reducing herself to an impalpable yet relational threat, she fosters the crisis in the separation of sexual roles and in the rules of creation and fruition. The very same crisis, although declined in a less painful and much more open determination of subjectivity, can also be observed in Julia Nicolai's poem I Oggetto. The ampersand symbol between poem and object is here the symptom of the redefinition of abuse categories of subordination, poetry, non-poetry, subject and object, sense and nonsense, of which the man-woman pair is a fundamental, although unspoken variant. In this sense goes Nicolai's obsessive insistence on textual and textile operations aimed at deviating women's manual activity activities in artistic sense. A first more direct example can be found in the series of the tapestry poems. The intertwining of wool knitted with needles is visually imitated, for example, in whole, whole, or in knit, knot, or in high tapestry. And then we have the sewing poems, where the operation gradually becomes more abstract, as for example, in the printed buttons, one which is, however, also physically sewn to the page with real red thread. Or in the poem Tautological, the Tautological poem, which combines a series of drum pins with a real one piercing the page. Or in that of the Cinque Colori, the Five Colors, the very last of the book, which consists in a photo of five spools of thread of different colors, each corresponding to a letter of the word poema. And then there is a cross-stitch page from the introduction to the manuscript found at Saragossa by Jan Potocki, as it appeared in the Adelphi edition of 1965. The best example, however, although it might not immediately look like that, is, according to me, the pin-down text. At the top of the white page, you can see there is attached a rectangular, a rectangular photo representing a paper sheet on which five pins hold down the cutout letters of the word poem, poem, letters that resemble as many dead butterflies and imply the writing's attempt to pin down the world. 
The clash of the material evidence of the pin with the second degree realism of the picture and the linguistic pun, which plays with the affinity of the Italian words punti, which also means stitches and appunti notes, suggests the cognitive and existential struggle on how poetic thought is formulated and what a poem really is from a female perspective. In the same but reverse way, other poems focus on symbolic objects traditionally associated with the figure of the male poet in the 20th century cracking their poetic value, so that the Olivetti type writer, for example, is crushed or flattened on a page where the most real object is a small rectangular sheet inserted in a cut physically open between the roller and the paper table, upon which the word poema sticks out in red ink. The space opened between the traditional concept of poetry and its female deconstruction thus allows for a collaborative process of reformulation of roles. Female writing and thought in particular appear to be grounded in poetry as a physical act, of which the textile imagery is the most powerful metaphor, meant as possession, transformation, even incest, a striking term that Nicolai used in a 1985 interview to describe her appropriation of the masculine poetic sphere. A metaphor of poetry making connected with the manipulation of words, threads, and bodies, the incest designates a hybrid mimic of non-commensurable elements and bears all the ambiguities rooted in its phonological proximity to the Latin form incidere in its significance, sexual and textual at once of engrave, cut, and slice. Thus, to conclude very briefly, embroidery with words or letters in the case of Larocca of Nicolai, Larocca and Nicolai's intermediate works and networks achieve, in my opinion, to renegotiate female subjectivity by means of a communicative violation, which however different, is rooted in the very same social, cultural, and material fabric, reframing the subject-object relationship through their own textual, textile gestures. I believe that the two artists and poets help foregrounding a female space of expression meant as an interwoven framework of theories and practices centered on an empowering materialization of weaknesses, illegibility, cancellation, silence, but in whose interstitial space women can be more than the trace black on white, as Laroca would write just before a bet, to which the world would often try to reduce them and embrace the negative yet powerful paradox of their identity. Thank you very much.